As immunotherapies become the standard of care treatment for an increasing number of cancers, technologies that were once only used in research settings follow into the clinic. This is because the information that is needed in order for immunotherapies to be effective is much more detailed than with traditional chemotherapies. Now that we're feeling confident about most of these technologies, I, you know, I think the next phase that we're in is, is application and really applying them to the, to the myriad of clinical trials in cancer immunotherapy that are happening so that we can learn as much as possible right in patients. But working with patient samples brings its own set of challenges, the biggest of which may be the amount of sample that can be obtained. As one of the core facilities, every patient that comes here and is operated on, we digest tumors. Tumor cells get purified for xenografts. The immune cells get profiled for single cell RNA-seq. We put them into culture for in vivo, in vitro expansion, but we do mass cytometry. We use Cytoff. So we have a 34 panel Cytoff antibody, metal conjugated antibody panel that we use to profile the immune cells that are in the tumor and then we pair that with the, the same population of cells from the peripheral blood. So we have paired samples of every patient that comes in. When you set out to do a sample analysis from a patient, be mindful of what you're gonna get back and what is the material you need to work with and set your experiments up in a position where when you get 50 cells back that you can do it or you have an assay that deals with 50 cells, or if you do need a, a milligram or 50 milligram, whatever you need, that you understand how difficult this is and where to get this from. That devil really lays in the detail there. Like technologically, a lot of things can be done, but often we don't do it because we actually don't realize we have to. The issue of limited sample is one that has driven the need for technologies to do more with less. This has been the case for cutting-edge tools such as RNA-seq and multi-parameter flow, and even with technologies that aren't necessarily seen as cutting-edge, but are often integral to patient care. Another example is single cell. There's huge interest in doing single cell analysis, and yes, there's heterogeneity. No question, we understand better. We can characterize some of it distinctly from different pathological states, this and the other. But if you can't tell me where that cell came from, you're only 20% there. I know it's heterogeneous. I know there are differences. I know that environment has different parts and you could influence in different ways. So until I can reference that to where they exist spatially, I can't get the full benefit of that information. The preservation of the three-dimensional spatial information of a tumor is one of the biggest advantages in using immunohistochemistry and is one reason why it remains a standard technique for tumor biopsy analysis. In terms of technologies that we've been exploring to help support that area of research, it comes to multiplexing. So we've invested heavily in multiplexed IHC, which enables us to look at, at the moment, up to six different targets in a single tissue section. And the advantage of IHC as a multiplexed technique is that you get a visual, you get the spatial analysis of not just what immune cell types are present within the tumor, but also where they are in relation to one another, in relation to the tumor cells, in relation to other targets that you might be interested to look at. Spatial imaging is going to be really important. Even for simple things like, um, you know, the older kind of, you know, types of immunotherapies where it's antibody-based therapies, some of the investigators using, you know, spatial profiling with high parameters has started to really identify the role that the immune system has in things, you know, like, you know, treating um, metastatic breast cancer patients with Herceptin. You know, David Rim at Yale has a nice paper demonstrating the role of immune infiltration and outcome in Herceptin-based therapies. And I think we're just kind of starting to really touch on, you know, different aspects of understanding the spatial organization of the tumor not just what is in the tumor, in outcome. The spatial information that can be obtained is important in determining if an immunotherapy, such as a checkpoint inhibitor, will be effective. This is because the presence of infiltrating T cells within the tumor, sometimes referred to as a hot tumor, is a positive indication that an immunotherapy may be successful. Conversely, tumors without infiltrating T cells, sometimes characterized with extensive myeloid cell infiltration, are known as cold tumors and are very likely not responsive to immunotherapies. 
I think when we first got into the multiplexing IHC space, we started out looking at two and then three and then four, and we were using chromogenic IHC tools to achieve that. And I think it's one of those areas where because there are now techniques out there to look at more, people want to look at more. And so we, as a consequence of being asked by our clients, really, that can we look at more than four, we move to a fluorescence based platform where we can currently look at six. There are developments going on with that same platform to increase the plex further than six. And the drive to increase the plex for these types of analysis has led to novel developments in both reagents and hardware. In the case of imaging, on the front of the system, we have our laser ablation chamber. And there you use standard immunohistochemistry techniques or immunofluorescent techniques. But instead of a fluorescently labeled antibody, again, you're using a metal tagged antibody. And then you use a standard type of workflow to stain the tissue. In this case, we can stain the tissue with up to 40 antibodies. And then when you load the slide into the Hyperion, what happens is a laser will come in and ablate a small amount of material from that slide and it will move it into the mass cytometer. So you can kind of think about the laser coming in, ablating a very small amount of material, and that is essentially analogous to a cell uh, moving into the instrument. And then you can analyze that small amount of material, you know, as you would a single cell, so you can quantitate the amount of proteins as correlated to the metal labeled antibodies at that particular point on the slide. We offer nowadays ultra high content imaging technology to get a much better understanding of what's going on in a tumor or a tumor sample. This is a fully automated platform where you do cyclic immunofluorescence with three to eight colors at a time. So after each round of cyclic immunofluorescence, you get rid of the labeling reagents based on a technology which allows to remove the labeling reagents. So we use what we call release reagents. So this allows you to analyze a tumor sample for 300 markers, um, 300 antibody epitopes. You can imagine if you, let's say a solid tumor, you can have a clear understanding about all the, in a tissue section, about all the cells which are present um, and the functional state of the, uh, of the cells. But just as Multiplex is giving pathologists more answers from a limited sample, other techniques are allowing clinicians and researchers to ask more precise questions using less material than ever. So understanding tumor microenvironment is probably our next frontier. Because any immune cell that has to go into tumor has to confront the tumor microenvironment. What are the cells that are in the tumor microenvironment? What are they producing? Why are they? And what are they producing such that they're suppressing the immune system in the tumor? Just imagine, one could be just a physical barrier that you have a tumor, and if it is encapsulated by very strong fibrous shield, immune cells may have a hard time getting in there. You may have stromal cells in the tumor that may be producing molecules that even if the immune cell infiltrated, it's not going to be able to actually impact the tumor because it is being negated because of cytokines. The myeloid cells, myeloid are suppressor cells, that are producing cytokines that are suppressing the immune cell. Then the tumor itself is producing molecules like Tja beta is one, just one example of it, that's suppressing immune system. Now, how it is configured, we are still beginning to figure out. What single cell RNA-seq tells you is that all the cells that are in there, but it's not able to tell you that where the cell is. Is the fibrous sheath outside? Is stromal cell next to the immune cell? Is it the myeloid cell interacting with the immune cell? And what are they producing where? And now with the FFP technologies or even using some of these the single cell technologies on the tissues will begin to address the single cell transcriptome and the position of that cell within the tissue. That is the technological revolution that is happening and is needed is to look at the single cell transcriptome and identify in the context where they are in the tissue. The tumor microenvironment is a combination of a lot of different cell types. 
it's very important to understand what types of cells are there and what they might be doing. There's infiltrating lymphocytes, there's angiogenesis going on, there's necrosis that might be going on in the center of tumors. Being able to see all that is important to understand first how the tumor's growing in the absence of treatment and also what the treatment might be doing. The techniques that are useful in that space include both single cell assays where you've dissociated the tumor and then enumerated the types of cells based on say flow cytometry or a single cell RNA-seq. Also spatial assays where it might be immunofluorescence or looking at RNA or protein or transcriptomic profiling done on a spatial basis where you're looking primarily at the RNA or genomic profiling looking at the DNA. You can think about it as almost a, a ladder or, you know, kind of a spectrum, you know. On the one side, you have what does the cell do? You know, what is its function? What activities does it have? And that's a functional phenotype. And then on the other far side of the spectrum, you have what are the genetics of the cells? In terms of epigenetics, what profile does it have? Is a population of cells clonal? Are the T cell receptors all directed against the same antigen? And I kind of view those as, you know, a spectrum. And then, you know, the next step in that is understanding transcript expression and seeing what transcripts are upregulated and downregulated. Then the next step is seeing what proteins are changed and, you know, and then how that changes function. So you have this kind of gradient and the technologies that we have available address certain portions of that spectrum and that's how I look at it. Because the root of all cancers lay at the genetic or epigenetic level, the importance of next generation sequencing technologies is clear. Identifying the mutation responsible for driving the cancer and using that information to determine the course of treatment is a big advance in oncology. But I think the breakthrough came from the fact that, you know, ALK mutation only happens in 2 or 3% of, of lung cancer patients. But those have such an overwhelming response so that it was actually determined that testing all patients for a chance of a 2 to 3% mutation rate is worthwhile because we make such a difference in those, those folks. So these approaches have really changed and have propelled us to do this. A variety of whole genome and whole exome sequencing platforms exist and both the throughput and cost has fallen substantially in the past five to ten years. This makes next-gen sequencing an extremely valuable tool for not just identifying mutations to direct treatment, but to also follow the evolution of the tumor during therapy. And as the field progresses, complementary technologies have been developed to make this sort of monitoring faster and easier. What's the technology that is probably best going to suit your purposes? And there are many possible answers to that question, i.e. potentially for tumors, many possible driver mutations, which if you knew what they were, could help better make a, a therapy choice or decide what the prognosis is. So oftentimes, if there are many, many possible answers, a very broad profiling platform such as next-gen sequencing is the platform of choice nowadays. On the other hand, once you've already profiled a tumor, you've decided on a treatment for a patient, and you've said, now I want to find out, is that treatment working? You can get uh, some very rapid data within a matter of several days to maybe uh, several months, basically. You can begin to see whether or not a patient is responding, you know, both for targeted therapies, for surgery, for immunotherapy, of course, as well. And that's all categories of immunotherapies. If you have some idea of markers that you're looking for based on a next-gen sequencing prior tumor profiling, then that can be extremely advantageous to be able to look for what you know you're looking for. But just knowing the sequence of the genome is not everything. Gene expression patterns can differ widely between cells within the tumor microenvironment. Understanding the tumor transcriptome at the single cell level can help link the cellular phenotype with its genotype, which has profound implications for researchers studying the molecular events of the tumor immune response. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, actually, technology and new discoveries go hand in hand. And sometimes uh, you have a question to ask, but you don't have technologies that can support or address the question. So we knew already that the exhausted T cells or dysfunctional T cells that infiltrate the tumor express a multitude of these checkpoint molecules, CTLA-4, PD-1, TIM-3, LAG-3, TIGIT, and the list goes on and on. And the question we had is that all are these molecules expressed all on the same cell as the cell is becoming dysfunctional, 
or is it a bunch of cells expressing PD-1, a bunch expressing CTLA-4, a bunch are expressing TIM-3 and others are expressing TGIT, or are there a combination thereof, one or two or two or three? And it has got very strong implications because if there's a T cells expressing only one checkpoint molecule, you can block with one, you will have resurgence of immune responses of that T cell with the hope that it will act on the tumor or the chronic viral infection clear it. But if it's a multitude of these checkpoint molecules expressed on the same cell, that means blocking one is not going to do the job. We couldn't address this question. In fact, I kept asking this question until the single cell RNA-seq came into being. Now, we had the perfect system. And like many of the technologies currently being used to study immunotherapy, RNA-seq is most powerful when it's combined with other tools. When one's looking at uh, profiling a tumor or even a patient's response to drugs that are being used to treat a tumor, it's very important to be able to look at the individual cells. There's a couple different settings in which you do that. One is where they're in the spatial context of the tissue that they're resident. Uh, another is in sort of these single cell type assays. And, and both are important. So from a cellular profiling standpoint, key markers that are, are looked at include DNA, RNA, protein. Those have typically been looked at in isolation from one another. So RNA-seq, or DNA-seq, or proteins largely accessed through antibodies and, and antibody conjugates. But now, in the last few years, more technologies are coming out which allow you to marry those two together. For instance, in the single cell assay space, uh, flow cytometry has long been a workhorse there. Whether it's you know, two color, four color, eight color, now with some of these spectral innovations, um, we're easily up to 30, 40 color. So you can profile cells with quite a few different markers on the surface and really look down to rare subsets and be able to confidently identify them. At the same time, looking at RNA-seq data, you can look at full transcriptome on a single cell basis. That gives you, you know, wonderful cell signatures, which allows you to look at, you know, from a DNA standpoint, maybe the genotype. By marrying together the protein side and the nucleic acid side, you get a much better resolution of what those cells might be, and you're able to measure a lot more parameters. So the two things that helped resolve this issue, one is CYTOF, and another is single cell RNA-seq. In CYTOF, you could use 25 different monoclonal antibodies that can identify the cell type, it can identify the function of the cell, it can also identify the molecules on the cell surface. And the single cell RNA-seq did the same thing, that you could have the whole genome expressed from a single cell and you could see that is the same cell expressing multitude of these checkpoint molecules. And if you have one or two or three or four together, and is there a functional implication of having these, all these molecules there? And by doing single cell RNA-seq, the data was very clear. The chance of a cell, an exhausted T cells express all these molecules, in fact, the PD-1, TIM-3, LAG-3, and TIGIT, these four molecules have a correlation coefficient of 10 to minus 23. That means these molecules are not coming alone. They all come with their brothers and sisters. And these molecules act together to induce T cell dysfunction. And if you have to block induction of T cell exhaustion or dysfunction, you may have to act on multiple checkpoint molecules in order to see an effect. And no wonder if you only block either CTLA-4 or PD-1 and your response rates are between 10 to 30 percent, no more. And when you block co-block, your responses rate go to 40 to 50 percent. So that means they are acting together and synergizing in order to actually give you a response. And this was with the advent of technology. Now we can not only see what this cell is expressing, we're seeing what are the implications of the expression of the checkpoint molecule on downstream biological function because we can look at both the phenotype and expression of molecules on the same cell, which could not be done before. In fact, I think single cell RNA-seq has revolutionized the way we work today. The tools being used to study cellular proteins, such as flow cytometry, have been in place for some time, but new developments have made it and related techniques much more sensitive with a significantly higher throughput. So if you take a step back to like the year 2000, the mid 90s, people were doing four color flow routinely in, in clinical 
core flow cytometry facilities and for research and there was a small community of people who were doing higher parameter work, but we would get asked pretty frequently, why do you bother? After all, you're seeing naive and memory cells and you, know, you don't really need that much more information beyond that. That's not a question that's asked anymore. You know, it's self-evident that there are tons and tons of molecules that drive immune responses in different ways that dictate the initial generation of the response, the shape of the response, the, how long it lasts, whether the cells get exhausted and so on. And we have an indication of that because of these high parameter technologies. And so that is all relatively new. And even the mindset of trying to measure as many things as we can at once to save samples, that's all relatively new. I mean, that was maybe mid 2000s, 2005, 2006, that people really started to understand that that was a possibility. And then it took some time to build up the technologies, to validate them. Certainly some of them are still getting validated. And now that we're feeling confident about most of these technologies, the next phase that we're in is application and really applying them to the myriad of clinical trials in cancer immunotherapy that are happening so that we can learn as much as possible right in patients. It's now bringing this spectral technology into the world of clinical application space. So being able to use the technology to detect cancer, blood cell cancers in patients, to be able to diagnose that patient better, faster, and then to be able to monitor that patient once they do start a therapy. That's what I'm pretty excited about with the availability now of spectral flow cytometry and the power that that can bring to that clinician. Advances in both conventional flow cytometry as well as the newer spectral flow cytometry have made it possible to analyze up to 40 proteins or features in one sample. Another antibody-based tool that has become popular for high-throughput protein analysis is mass cytometry, sometimes referred to as CYTOF. So the original CYTOF technology can be thought of in a very similar way that you think about standard fluorescent-based flow cytometry. You essentially will label an antibody with a particular molecule that you can read out on your instrument. In the case of flow cytometry, that is a fluorophore. Uh, and in the case of mass cytometry, we will label the antibody with a unique metal tag. And then you use your kind of standard, you know, types of separations uh, for putting a single cell uh, into the instrument. And then in the case of fluorescence, you'll read the amount of signal coming from that fluorescent molecule and in the case of mass cytometry, that cell will be uh, injected into the Helios, the current Cytoff instrument. It gets completely ionized in the plasma, and then all of the ions move into a mass spectrometer. Uh, we gate most of those ions away, things that are really abundant, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. And then you can then essentially, in the mass spectrometer, count the number of unique metals that were on that particular cell. And so that's how you would quantitate the amount of that protein is you measure the amount of um, ion current from that particular um, metal. And while both flow cytometry and mass cytometry are being optimized to handle more queries per sample, there are new mass spectrometry based tools being developed that are directed at building on those assays. So our assays are based on a targeted form of mass spectrometry called multiple reaction monitoring mass spectrometry. It's sometimes also referred to as selected reaction monitoring mass spectrometry, so abbreviated MRM or SRM. Conventional immunoassays, although uh, they have a lot of strengths and have taken us very far in biomedical research over the past 50 years, they require that these antibodies be monospecific. And that's because the antibody binds to the protein in a biopsy or a plasma sample, but the detection system uh, is not specific to that protein. In order to detect that antibody binding the protein, there is a mass, an enzymatic or fluorescent tag on the other end of the antibody. And that signal comes off the other end of the antibody regardless of what the antibody is bound to. And because the human proteome is extraordinarily complex, the vast majority of antibodies bind to more than one epitope in cells, and this affects the accuracy of the measurements. So really what we have done is to combine 
traditional immunoassay approaches with a more specific detection system on the back end that is a mass spectrometer. We bind to and pull proteins of interest out of complex biospecimens and then we detect them using uh, the mass spectrometer where we get a partial mass fingerprint and properly executed can achieve very high levels of specificity. The mass spectrometer as a detector is also very forgiving in terms of antibody performance. Even if an antibody binds to multiple proteins in the biospecimen, they have different masses and so they can be distinguished from each other using the mass spectrometer as a detector. While MRM mass spec broadens the arsenal of tools available to researchers for proteomic studies, it is fair to say that, as of now, existing technologies such as flow cytometry and mass cytometry are still more commonly used. With high-parameter flow cytometry, with mass cytometry, these are all proteomics-based technologies, so they're going to be focused primarily on phenotyping the cell to identify what it is, and then maybe, if you're lucky, trying to see what it does. In the case of mass cytometry, mass cytometry does signaling assays really well, so you can really see what signal transduction pathways are done or are invoked um, during an immune response. High-parameter flow cytometry does really well with phenotyping of cells, identifying what type of cell it is, maybe looking at what cytokines it makes. And these aren't mutually exclusive things, but you know, just relatively, that's kind of how I see how you would use each of those techniques. It's the combination of technologies that help that clinician really understand what's going on in that patient's specimen or with that immunotherapy. And that's exciting to me. That's something that I really do enjoy watching is the ability to combine these technologies and build a better tool overall for them to be able to help that, that patient. So there's technologies out there now that can tag antibodies with oligonucleotides and allow them to be worked into the workflow of RNA-seq or DNA-seq. In that case, you end up with very high numbers of, say, cell surface markers, typically the ones you'd find in flow, and marry that together with the transcriptome analysis. And we're typically doing transcriptome plus up to about 250 antibodies on the cell surface on a single cell basis across tens of thousands of cells at the same time. So that provides quite a bit more data than we would have gotten even two, three years ago. And the findings that one gets from that by having all those cell populations um, clearly identified in a single experiment, it speaks to the power of that kind of a technique. And then there's this really interesting middle ground, which I call molecular cytometry, where you can make these measurements at once. And we've always really been able to do this. If you couple flow cytometry sorting with RNA sequencing, even in, on bulk cells, you can do this. You can understand what transcripts are present and what the genetics of particular cell populations are. But we can do this without invoking two instrumentations and two technologies now. So molecular cytometry basically replaces the fluorescent tags that are on flow cytometry antibodies with oligonucleotide tags. And then you stain the cells for protein and you capture them either in droplets with the 10x genomic systems or other systems like that, or you capture them in microwells with BD's ABSEQ system. And once you capture the cells, you can lyse them and you can read what antibodies were bound because you have those oligonucleotides that are released, those tags, and then you can read what transcripts are present. So you're in this middle part of the spectrum then where you get both the protein information and the transcript information, and you can measure more parameters at once without the complications of cross-channel issues that you have in other cytometry technologies. And you get this information on both of these modes of expression. You know, you have protein expression and gene expression, and you can see for the same cell where they're dysregulated or where there's post-transcriptional regulation and things like that. While some researchers are working with clinical samples and using cutting-edge technologies to study a cell's genome, transcriptome, and proteome, others are working out cell-based assays designed to follow how effective an immune cell is at targeting a tumor cell. What's fundamentally happening is we have a mantra of four things. It's got to be a living cell. It's got to be real-time information. It's got to be kinetic so we can follow the biology and it has to be non-perturbing label free so that the relevancy is improved dramatically. 
By developing a reliable cell-based assay to measure how different cells from either the innate or adaptive immune systems can kill tumor cells, the hope is that researchers can try different targets or therapy combinations to identify the most effective solutions. But not all technological innovations are instrument or reagent based. There is still the need to understand how an intact immune system responds to a tumor in an experimental setting. And to understand this, a more sophisticated model system is required. If you build it into a, you know, a well-defined mouse strain, you can take out CD8 T cells really nicely. You can ask mechanistic questions. You can replace, you can take away and see how important is it is it necessary and sufficient for the immune response? What are the critical components to a productive immune response in this mouse model that we're trying to recapitulate the biology of what you see in patients? And I think half of it is trying to understand how to make a good productive immune response. What are the keys to that? And then what goes wrong when the tumor is growing and how does the immune response get suppressed or just become dysfunctional. If you give immunotherapy X, how does that change that in a, in a reductionist way and start going you know, step by step? And then taking that into patients. The interesting aspect of patient-derived xenograft work that is emerging as a critical importance is the, is the tumor microenvironment. Um, common strategies to engraft a tumor into the subcutaneous space in a mouse don't always purely replicate what a liver carcinoma is going to look like or what a epithelial tumor in the lung is going to look like. So orthotopic patient-derived xenograft models are becoming increasingly important. And as we think about the interplay of the immune system in a tumor setting, there's really very limited research models that combine orthotopic tumor models and the humanized immune system that enables the testing of those purely human-specific uh, monoclonal antibody therapies. It's quickly becoming a very robust model to test very specific questions. It is not a perfect system of a replicated human immune function in a rodent system. However, it does provide many of the essential ingredients necessary for determining specifically if a molecule interacts specifically in blood, in circulation, in tissues, in, in the microenvironment of the tumor in a way that's consistent with our understanding of the immunologic pathway we're intending to activate or, or deactivate. So it provides a more clear picture of the direct therapeutic interacting directly with its target it intends to engage. So that extends our research paradigm preclinic. Taken together, the outcome of all of these technological advances is data, lots of it. So much data, in fact, that managing it and extracting meaning from it presents its own challenge. So let's talk a little bit about data. Data is something very passionate about. And we can make lots of data. Uh, we can actually view at some level. We can talk about the quality of viewing the data. But the reason this is the case, and I just tell a quick story. So Raytheon is one of the companies in defense system that has satellites that can see every inch of the earth, anytime, any hour during the day. And they're constantly recording to look for something that only occurs one second out of a year. So the problem isn't being able to see everything. The problem isn't even the ability to record everything. The problem is when am I looking when something important is happening or is going to happen? So I believe that what we need to do is we need to bring the AI and the machine learning so we're not just creating volumes of information, we're training the systems to look when it's important and to be able to be retrospective about it because otherwise you overload the brain. I think that this is kind of a virtuous cycle that we need to think about. You do the technology development, you develop the hardware, the reagents, everything that it takes to do the experiments. You develop the applications and the use cases and use them like crazy. And then you deal with the data, figure out the best ways, and then come back to the question, what are we missing? What don't we know yet? And then you go back to the technology development. And hopefully all of us are working within these cycles in different pieces of the cycles and asynchronously. And I think that will help to really power the field of immunotherapy forward. And ultimately, since so much of medicine is directed towards cancer treatment and immunotherapy, it'll power medicine forward, especially as our knowledge from these approaches trickles down into vaccine research, into understanding autoimmune diseases and so on.
The pace of discovery in immunotherapy is increasing, and with it comes the promise of a true cure for cancer. But before that goal can be achieved, there is still much more about the tumor and its microenvironment that has yet to be discovered.